Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Troyer, Dean of the Bell College of Business at UNC Charlotte. Welcome to the inaugural panel for our Dean's Leadership Series. I also want to acknowledge that today is Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year in Judaism. For those who cannot join us live, today's program will be recorded. So this lunchtime virtual series is helping to kick off our year-long 50th anniversary of the Bell College. The college was established in November 1970 with just eight full-time faculty members. Jump ahead five decades and the college now has more than 30,000 alumni and over 100 full-time faculty. And we are a major economic driver in the Charlotte region. That's something to celebrate. For 50 years, business niners have been at the forefront as doers, bold leaders, change agents. That's also why we chose for our anniversary theme, green and gold drive business. You'll see more of this theme throughout the year, but I wanted to give you a sneak preview. The Dean's Leadership Series aims to celebrate the 50th anniversary of our college, and also to give back to the Charlotte community by welcoming distinguished panels of executive business practitioners and thought leaders who will share their insights and experiences regarding current challenges and future opportunities facing our business community. I cannot think of a more important conversation to have today than this, focusing on leading on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. I'm also ready to learn from this distinguished group of leaders. So let me introduce our moderator today, Dr. George Banks. George is an associate professor in the Department of Management. His research and teaching interests include strategic human resource management, leadership and team development, ethics, and research methods and statistics. He has worked with diverse clients, including the Missile Defense Agency and the Transportation Security Administration. He's also part of a cross-disciplinary team from UNC Charlotte that was just recently awarded a nearly $600,000 multi-year National Science Foundation grant to support ethical research across the university. Please welcome Dr. George Banks. Thank you, Dean Troyer. I'm uh, very excited to be here today for this important conversation. Like you, I look forward to learning from our uh, excellent panel of business leaders. So I'll start first uh, by giving a brief introduction of each of them. First, we have Letitia uh, Bird, who is a certified coach and talent development consultant. She is the founder and CEO of Bird Career Consulting. Letitia partners with companies and uni universities to deliver keynotes, training, coaching, curriculum centered around culture, engagement, upward mobility, and diversity, and as well as inclusion. She earned her bachelor's degree in accounting from the Belk College in 2012. And last fall, she was the recipient of the Belk College Outstanding Young Alumna Award. Welcome, Leticia. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we, next, we have M Mike uh, Freno, who is president of the Charlotte-based Bearings LLC and is a member of the Bearings Executive Leadership Team and the Bearings Board of Directors. Mike is also chairman of the Board of Bearings BDC, Inc., an external business development company managed by Bearings. His experience spans two decades on the buy side, focusing on both equity and debt investments. Bearings is a global financial services firm with more than 346 billion in assets under management and over 2,000 associates. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. Next, we have Omar Jorge Pena, who is the CEO of Compare Foods in Charlotte and chairman of the Aurora Grocery Group which operates 24 supermarkets under Campare Foods, Gala Foods, and Gala Fresh Supermarkets. Campare Foods is the largest ethnic supermarket chain on the East Coast. Omar is a second generation grocer working in the family business beginning in his teenage years. He served two terms as the chair of the Latin American Coalition, the largest Latino advocacy and cultural organization in North Charlotte. He has also served as president of the Carolina Foods Industry Council and is on the Belk College Board of Advisors. Welcome, Omar. Good to be here. Thank you. 
And finally, we have Craig Parkin, who is a Senior Managing Director and Regional Segment Head for the Atlantic South Region of TIA's Institutional Relationships Business. He is a member of TIA's Enterprise Leadership Group and has served as a co-chair of TIA's Charlotte Leadership Council and as an executive sponsor of Empowered, a resource group for African-American and Caribbean employees. He received the 2019 Inclusive Leader Award. Craig has also created the Breaking Bread ser uh, series and other mentoring and leadership groups for diverse populations within TIA. Uh, Craig also serves on the Belt College's Board of Advisors. Welcome, Craig. Thank you, Josh. Good to be here. All right. So a little later in this program, you'll have uh, uh, the panelists will be answering some, some of your questions that you can submit through the chat function. But we've got a couple of questions that I'd like to start with uh, for each of our panelists uh, to touch upon. All right. So I'll direct this first question here to Mike uh, and everyone else will have uh, also a chance to comment as well. Mike, could you tell us what benefits does diversity have for your organization? Well, thanks for the question, George, and thanks for everyone who's, who's watching, watching online, and thanks to, to Dean Troyer for including us. I'll, I'll answer it within two aspects of, of our particular business. I, I certainly think from a management standpoint, it's, it's well documented everywhere how having diverse thought, diverse experiences at the table creates better decisions for everyone. Um, it, it's... And, and we've taken that, and, and it's always been a hallmark of bearings to, to have d diverse leadership at the table when we're making investment decisions. So we, we run committee-based investment decisions across the board. It's always been something that we've done because we've always believed that the, a group will make better decisions than an individual. Um, and by having a group together, if it's a homogenous group of folks who think in similar fashions, that defeats the purpose. Um, and so we've always had that as, as a hallmark of our, of our process from an investment standpoint. Admittedly, and I'll, I'll get it out early on, we've not done as good a job of building that diverse <clears throat> group of people to make the decisions. Uh, but I think, you know, again, it's something we've acknowledged. We've not necessarily gotten to the point where we'd like to be, but it helps us not only from a management standpoint, but as we invest our clients' money, it's, it's critical to have those diver diverse points of view. Great. Other ideas? Oh, is, go ahead. Thanks, George uh, and Mike. I, again, pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me to this very important panel. So I think that the benefit that it has for us at Compare Foods is that our business is diversity, right? So what we're targeting is the entire international community here in Charlotte, whether you're from Latin America, Africa, Asia, Europe, Whatever part of the world you're from, we want you in our store, right? So diversity is especially important for us because we use our employees almost as ambassadors to the community, right? So when we started hiring, uh, when we first hired African employees that came from Africa, uh, we found out that there was a very vibrant African community in Charlotte that we can go and interact with and, and participate in their festivals and support their events. And in turn, we brought their products into the store because we began to get educated on what those customers were looking for. So that, that interchange of ideas is so important for us just to stay uh, relevant to what's, what, with what's happening in the community. And, and really we use uh, the diversity that we have with our employees, not just with Latin America, but throughout the world as, as a connection to the community at large. Wonderful, thank you. So George, I'll, I'll hop in and, and talk a little bit about the experience that we've had at, at TIA. And I think that the benefits have been um, numerable, um, external as well as internal. So diversity has been at the heart of our organization for decades now. We were actually the first Fortune 500 company to name uh, a black CEO, um, Dr. Cliff Wharton. And then we were actually also the first Fortune 500 to appoint uh, a woman to his board. I believe it was 1958 or 59. So making some of these bold moves, you know, it's, it, it's gone back a ways. And um, it, it wouldn't be a, a panel if, you know, I didn't throw out like a stat or something, right? So I, I, in prepping for this, you know, my, um, I, I checked in with some people at the, the company and they, uh, revealed a McKinsey study that talked about companies that are in the top quartile for gender diversity 
outperforms competitors by 15% and ethnic diversity by 35%. And if they're in the um, bottom quartile for both, then they see that um, their profitability is 29% less likely to achieve above average um, profitability. So at TIA, we've actually 42% women, 36% um, people of color. That's significant. When you think of the financial services industry, that's pretty significant. And it starts from that, that history that we have. Um, externally, our, our clients, the companies we serve are expecting to see it. They, they look for it in our engagements with them. They um, ask for it in the business proposals, the RFPs. Uh, the, those that prioritize it actually demand it um, of their vendors and strategic partners. So us being able to, um, to show up this way allows us to serve them in ways that is reflective of who they are, you know, with respect, understanding, appreciation for what they bring to the table. So we've managed to um, use it as a business imperative. So it's not just a nice to have, but it's something that from a business standpoint is, is critical for us. Um, to go on with this a, a little bit more, we've actually leveraged, um, so, uh, um, business resource groups within the, the company to be able to um, drive business impact. So uh, we call them business resource groups, other companies might call them employee resource groups or affinity groups that are around particular uh, you know, traits or characteristics. So for African-American employees, Hispanic employees, LGBTQ, seasoned professionals, those with diverse abilities um, or, or disabilities. And so we um, have nine of them and we call them business resource groups because we look for them to um, help drive out our business objectives and our, and our needs. And so um, as an example, um, the BRG that we call Diverse Abilities, um, they recently provided feedback on a marketing program that um, was used to ensure that what we were putting out was inclusive of individuals with both visible disabilities as well as invisible disabilities. So that's just an example of how we use it. But I'd say internally is where we really get some, some major benefits. And if I looked at it from a, a personal standpoint, um, I'm a black male leader in financial services. There's a, a much smaller population of us um, nationally. And it's truly meaningful, almost immeasurable to work for a company that values that difference. When employees across the organization can look up, so to speak, and see senior leadership that looks like them is powerful. Our CEO is black, um, Roger Ferguson. He's one of uh, just a handful um, as a part of the, the, the Fortune 500. Our chairman is black. Our chief human resource officer, the head of our asset management business, head of tech and ops, head of wealth management, chief marketing officer, chief legal officer, they're all people of color or women. And so that diversity is, is really ingrained in us. And this really had an impact following the, the tragic death of George Floyd. Um, when many people were hurting and not knowing how to express the anger, the frustration, um, or even how to relate, you know, TIA, we held an all employee video call that was led by our CEO, Roger Ferguson, and it was it included a diverse group of leaders telling personal stories of the impacts of race and racism in their lives. It was raw. Um, it was emotional. Uh, it was honest. Actually, the head of our um, advocacy and oversight area, who's actually a white male, um, from the South talked about um, the history or the legacy of slave ownership in his family and the impact that that's had. You don't have those conversations in corporate America too often. And it, you know, really impacted or spoke to people in our organization in ways that they've never experienced in their professional lives. And I had the, the you know, the honor of participating in that. And as you can imagine, the response from the other African-American employees in the company was huge, but what was even more impactful was those, the, the outpouring or the outreach from those who weren't um, African-American saying, I had no idea, but I want to learn more. How can I help to make a difference? I'm married to someone who's black or I have, biracial, have a biracial child or grandchild. Um, how do I broach the topic um, with, with people who may not know? So it was really amazing and it launched uh, what we call our Be the Change initiative. It has gotten a tremendous amount of attention. So if we didn't have that diversity already in place, that event doesn't happen and it doesn't take us down this path. So, great. Thanks. Thank you, Craig. Leticia? Yes. Um, 
again, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited and honored to be here. Um, just to kind of echo off of everything the other panelists have, have said, um, I want to bring in the perspective of uh, my experience as a career coach and a talent development consultant. I work with a lot of organizations in various industries and even coach their leaders on how to drive inclusion, how to drive diversity. Um, I can't, you know, not mention the employee experience. Um, yes, we all know that companies that are diverse perform better uh, from a sales, you know, uh, perspective. But when you really think about the identity and the makeup of your organization, I think a lot about em employee safety, right? And do your employees at your organizations feel that they can really show up and, and bring their full selves to work? That actually takes a lot of work, but I will say that when a company is diverse and employees from a diverse background or marginalized background see others that looks like them, that does increase retention. Um, that creates this sense of belonging, right? Because in, for me, uh, speaking from a, a, a place of intersectionality, you know, I am African American and I'm also a woman. And so with that being said, when I am showing up at a, a workplace or a company, I would like to see people that look like me in positions that I aspire to. Um, and I'm glad that now the experiences of marginalized employees are really um, coming to the forefront and, and people are willing to have a conversation about what needs to happen and what needs to change here. But I will say that um, this is a great start, right? But it is so important to think about the experiences of your employees um, from a belonging perspective, and then also looking at your community as well. I know uh, one of our, our panelists touched on this, but you have to think about the community that you serve and how are you connecting to your clients, to your customers, to those that do want to um, become a loyal customer and also an ambassador to that organization. And I think now uh, customers, clients, they want to know, well, what is this company doing on the inside? Yes, they might do good work, but what is their culture like? Is this a company that I want to be um, attached to, right? And so I think that from that perspective, it's important. Um, the world is, is very um, diverse, right? I think now in 2020, um, we're more diverse than we've ever been here um, in the States before. And so making sure that your organization definitely reflects the population that you serve is extremely beneficial uh, from a diversity um, perspective. Great, thanks. <clears throat> so let me ask a, a follow-up question here. So you all have mentioned benefits of diversity for your organization. And I'd like to, to tease this out a little bit more um, to explicitly ask you, what are some outcomes that you might look at from your organization's perspective, whether those outcomes be for internal stakeholders like your employees or external stakeholders like uh, customers, clients, uh, those in the, the Charlotte business community? What types of outcomes does your organization uh, tend, to, tend to focus on in terms of um, benefits that emerge from diversity? Well, I'll, I'll jump in, and I think Craig talked. You know, we're in we're in similar industries, so he he touched on a, a number of those. I think we, clients, from our perspective, are are demanding it, and so if you you look at it from what is the right thing to do or what is the right thing to do from a business perspective, the two are aligned, and and your clients are are going to hold you accountable to that, as are your internal stakeholders are going to start holding you accountable for that, um, and and so I think it's it's an existential risk for firms who who ignore this. And, and what steps are you taking to do this? Aside from the, the again, the, the better business decisions that you'll make, and as, as the other panelists highlighted, the empirical data is there. You can, you can choose to ignore it if you, you want to, but the empirical data is there that, that diversity breeds a better culture and ultimately better outcomes, which is what we should all be, be striving for if we're just looking at it from, from a leadership standpoint. Um, so I don't think you know, leaders or, or anyone has an opportunity to do that. Talent retention, um, it will be one that is going to be challenged as well if you don't take the right steps to to tap into the entire community of where your talent pool will be if you're only looking at a narrow subset for us that happens to be across the globe um, but but the challenges of different races are different geographically it's not all the same and the experiences by some in 
in the U.S. are going to be dramatically different from from others in in Europe, and so we have to be open and and aware of that. And and looking at things um, through the lens of a white male in an industry that's largely white males at this point in time, um, from my standpoint, yeah, this has been a a pretty good period of learning and listening, um, and just simply saying I don't have the answers to this. Uh, others have better answers, and and just listening to it, but. To, in order to continue to succeed for all the leaders that are on here, and I think anyone you'll talk about this, this is a, a critical juncture for, for businesses and we'll have to continue to move in the right direction. Great. All right, uh, I've got a second question here uh, that I'd like to uh, direct to Leticia to start us off. What lessons might you share with other organizational leaders regarding how you promote diversity and inclusion? Where does diversity, equity, and inclusion start? Uh, that's a great question. You know, one, I would say it starts from within the organization, um, definitely driven at the top um, of the organization, but also when you think about promotion, um, that can be for really all employees. I think that d &I should be looked at as a core business function, you know, the same way that we put resources and energy and time into you know our marketing accounting operations all of those other functions diversity should be a core business function as well um, also note that it can't be solved overnight you know there's no one size fits all approach to this um, and it's so important to do the actual work not just talking about it and saying we you know we stand um, with diversity and inclusion, it's important to us, but when your employees leave for the day or log off for the day, you know, what are they actually, how are they feeling, right? That's what I'm really thinking about, again, as a coach. Um, I do think that DNI should be tied to metrics. Um, so just to throw out a few, uh, recruitment, retention, and advancement. First, thinking about recruitment. Um, is your organization uh, diversifying their talent pool? You have to be very intentional about hiring diverse talent. Um, and there is diverse talent out there, talented diverse talent. I want to just point that out. Um, but our companies ensuring that the recruitment process is free of exclusionary practices. Um, are we looking in new areas, again, to recruit? Um, so drilling into those employee metrics uh, would be very, very uh, valuable. Uh, but I would also from a recruitment perspective, think about your recruitment process in whole. Um, so with that being said, who is on the selection committee, right? Who is making these hiring decisions? Do they have uniform questions that are free of bias? Um, so who is driving that change? Um, when you think about retention, what is that employee experience like? Um, I think it's great that companies are now starting to track um, how long employees are staying at the organization. I think they should look at this by core business function. Uh, also look at it by race, uh, age, by gender, and really kind of understand where are employees dropping off? Who's not getting promoted? Who's getting uh, the same opportunities over and over again? Are employees being sponsored, right? And that's when we really start to think about how we are advancing our talent. Um, and making sure again here that employees are being sponsored. Um, those that do have, a, are, excuse me, are in a position of privilege or power, how are you distributing that power to those that may not have it or don't feel empowered? You know, I do think that uh, having um, ERGs, that's great. Having events to celebrate our differences um, is very, very important. But what are companies doing throughout the entirety of the year? Um, so again, putting resources in it, putting time into it, know that it's not going to just change overnight. This is something that you have to be committed to for the long haul. Um, but I do think that also listening to your employees um, will give you, or for those organizational leaders here today, will give you a lot of the answers um, that you may be needing. And if if you're not doing that, then also hiring a, a DNI consultant. You know, bring in practitioners that are skilled um, in these areas that can come in and really help to um, identify what strategies uh, will work. Great, thank you. 
I, I want to ask Leticia one more follow-up question real quick, and then I'll, I'll, I want to hear from uh, the rest of the panelists for this question. Leticia, you mentioned sponsorship. Now, I think a lot of us have heard about mentors and the benefits of mentoring. My understanding of sponsors is a sponsor is really someone that advocates for you and kind of is your champion within the organization. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that for some in the audience that may not be as familiar with sponsor, sponsors compared to mentors? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, thank you for that question. So um, there is such a difference between a mentor and a sponsor. A sponsor is someone that is going to, like you said, advocate for you when you're not in the room, that is going to be pushing for you to get that promotion, pushing for you to get that big um, you know, project or that visibility of the organization that you uh, need to advance. Um, someone that actually has the ears of leadership and that can create some change. Um, that is going to be different from a mentor. In my definition of a mentor, difference um, between a mentor and a sponsor is a mentor is someone that is there to give business, um, not business, but any type of advice, you know, to help with navigating the workplace or navigating life's challenges. But a sponsor is someone that is really going to make change um, provide access to opportunities, provide access to a network that will help someone really get ahead. Because a lot of times, especially from a uh, from a, a background of a marginalized employee, they may not have the same relationships. They may not feel even comfortable speaking up. So having someone really kind of holding their hand and bringing them up um, and advocating for them is going to do wonders for someone's career. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay, so uh, for the rest of the panel here, I'll just repeat the question uh, real quick. Uh, what m lessons might you share with other organizational leaders regarding how you promote diversity and inclusion within your or organization? Well, it's probably the smallest business on the panel. Um, I, I think that one of the flaws that I realized was that we did not have these formal processes set up. Right, so there was a lot of uh, personal relationships involved in our promotion practices. Um, you know, I get along well with so and so, so let's move him to this managerial position. Well, he might not have had the best skills for that position. There might have been someone with better skills that would have done a better job, but because maybe that that cultural connection wasn't there, they weren't looked at the same way. And I've been very intentional about changing that culture in in our business and you know for every management position making it clear these are the skills that you need to do this job well and making it clear to all the employees that these are the skills so that they can work on them and improve them and develop them so that when the opportunity does come up then they're ready to take that position regardless of their cultural background or where they came from or anything else right um, and to be honest it's caused some friction internally with some of the old guard in the company because you know some of the people that have been here for a long time said, well that's not the way we used to do it and i'm pushing and saying well that's the way we're going to do it now and they're not very happy about it but it's what you need to do to make it a fair playing field for everyone right if everyone doesn't know what the rules are then it's not a fair game right so i think that's one of the things that i've been very intentional about with our hr department is saying for all of our management positions this is what we need our managers to do and now let's tell our employees that these are the skills that we want to develop in them so that they're ready to take that position when it becomes available um, also changing the mindset with our managers because again the grocery industry is, is not finance it's not law it's not accounting it's not you know you don't have too many mbas and jds and mds working in grocery stores um, so, but, but changing the culture of the managers from being a boss to being an educator, right? Your job is not to reprimand and to discipline and to come down hard when someone is five minutes late for their shift. Your job is to be, uh, you know, mentor is really kind of an overused word, but almost like a teacher, right? To, to, to guide every single one of, your, of the people that you're supervising so that they can do a better job and give them the tools and, and the understanding of why it's important just to be on time for your, for, for, for your shift, right? Why is it important to keep 
your cash register clean? Well, because people are putting their food on there and you don't want cross contamination so that people get sick, right? People are taking food home. It's very important for us to have impor uh, good hygiene. So don't just tell the employee, clean your register. It's no, we have to clean our register every 15 minutes for X, Y, and Z reason so that they understand why, they're, why it's an important part of their job function, right? So I, I think that changing the mindset on the way that managers treat their, the people that they're supervising, the employees that they're supervising, also goes a long way towards making every single employee feel more included and, and part of the team. And, and then it helps them do a better job to eventually get promoted in the future. So George, so, um, let me build a little bit on this. One of the things that uh, we focus on is the inclusion aspect of it. So you hear about diversity and inclusion um, all the time, but a lot of the focus and attention just goes to the diversity piece of it. And in our organization, we've actually flipped it. We actually don't call it DNI, we call it IND, inclusion and diversity, because we've done a pretty decent job over the years, as I was talking about the numbers and those things of the representation piece of it. We still have more work to, to, to do. But once you have that in place, then are you tapping into it? That's where the real value comes from, is when you tap into that diversity. And um, we used to have a saying in the organization um, which was diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is actually being asked to dance. And it's a very simple way of understanding the, the difference between them. And we go all think back to, to parties and things that we've been to where you might, you know, people are just hugging the wall or the music isn't what, you know, isn't, isn't speaking to you. And then you leave and it's just like, uh, that was a waste of time. That's sometimes the experience that employees have when they go to a company that, yeah, they hired me but then they never asked me for my insights, never asked me for my perspective. Um, and, and that is a challenge. And then they walk away, they leave. And then that's the retention piece that Mike was talking about is that now you're not holding on to that talent that you spent considerable resources attracting. But when you go to that party and they invite you out onto the floor or they're playing the music that you're into and you feel the vibe and you feel that connection, you remember that. Like we can all remember when our 20s and college days, you can still remember parties that you went to that would really spoke to you if you really think of it that way. And, um, and that's what you want to be able to provide. You want to bring them out to the floor, um, have the conversations that they connect into, and then make them feel like they have a voice, that they can contribute, and then they're a part of the vibe of the, of the company, or even just down to your team. There's some people on here who are not at the top of the organization, or they just have their team. How are you bringing the various people to the table? And it's not just about racial, ethnic diversity and those things. It's just from where they're coming from, their experiences, their backgrounds, are we tapping into that um, the way that we need to? And then that's when you really start to get the value. When you don't, that's when mistakes happen. That's when performance slips. We can see companies that have made the mistakes of where clearly is like, did they have a woman involved with this in this discussion before they came out with this ad campaign? Did they have uh, somebody who's African American before they put that ad out? Or it was, you can see it. It's as obvious. And so that's where the real value is is taken into or or is seen is when you have those people um, on the team, but then you're really tapping into what their experiences are. George, if I can, if I can um, just add on one thing. I'm having a hard time remembering my 20s, Craig, if I'm honest, many of the parties, but um, point well taken. Um, I think one of the, the things that we've got, I, I believe, I agree exactly what Craig said, that the, the, the diversity is a statistic, and it should be the outcome of getting inclusion and equity right. Are you, are you including people in the decision? Are you giving them an equal opportunity to succeed? And in many cases, as Leticia mentioned, you need advocacy for that. Um, one of the things we've had to go and, and, and we've done and we're in the process of it is unconscious bias training. It's nothing nefarious necessarily, but Omar touched on it briefly. If you have a connection with someone because you have similar interests or you have similar things, you're naturally gravitating towards them. And we all need to take a step back and say, am I making the best decision for the company or is it just someone I connect with better? Whether they speak the same language as me, whether they went to the same college as me, we have those connections and it makes it, it, you gravitate towards it. So having, having group, diverse group of people around you to say you may have a blind spot here, 
um, is, is a step. Um, you've got to acknowledge it. Again, I think the unconscious bias creeps in because we all have it. It's again, it's nothing negative. We're all born with, with certain things that we enjoy and, and people that, that we enjoy being around. We all have different interests, but we can't let that cloud the best decision. And if you get this wrong, we can go out, we can all go out and hire a bunch of diverse employees and have a statistic in six months, if they don't feel included, if they don't feel part of it, they're gonna be gone. So it has to, in our, my opinion, be part of your entire talent management process. From day one, when they walk in the door to the recruitment, to every step of the way, are you making sure your human capital strategy is firmly aligned with your inclusion, equity, and diversity strategy? If not, you're just gonna look good for a period of time from a statistics standpoint, but it won't have sustainability or longevity. Great, thank you, uh, all, all four of you. Uh, and this kind of uh, tied into a, another question we had about how do you create this inclusive uh, work environment? So uh, Omar, Leticia, would you uh, care to uh, maybe add on to, uh, we could continue with Craig's metaphor. How do you get people, once they're at the dance, to get onto that dance floor? How do you put on like the right song that really gets people feeling like, you know, excited and, and you know, like they're jiving and they wanna get out there and just kind of let loose? What I realized very early on is that the culture starts at the top, right? The tone is set by the leaders. It's set by the CEO. It's set by the senior executive team, right? So if you have a clubby, chummy, exclusive country club style of leadership, the rest of the organization is going to feed off of that. They're going to see it. They're going to feed off of it. And they're going to realize, oh, this is not a place that I'm welcome, right? But if you are intentional about making sure that there is an attitude of respect, of open-mindedness, of humbleness, humbleness is so important because it is so easy for us to believe that the way that we grew up is the best way or that my food is the best food or that my upbringing was the best upbringing, my religion is the best religion, my sports team is the best sports team. No, it's not, <laughs> right? It's great for you and it did a great job with you but you need to be open-minded and humble enough to realize that the person next to you has different experiences that are just as valid as yours, right? And once, once you make that realization and you're able to, to, to teach that to everyone else in your organization, you need to be open-minded and, and humble regarding the way that you interact with all of your coworkers because their experiences are just as valid as yours. Just because you're a Panthers fan and you're a Falcons fan doesn't mean that one is wrong or the other one is right. You know, those are both equally valid NFL teams to root for. And I'm using that just as an example of something innocuous. You can get into a lot more tricky, complicated, and controversial detail regarding that, right, um, about those differences. But, but tribalism is a real factor. And I think that's a little bit of what Mike was touching on before, is we are naturally attracted to people that share our qualities, because we feel protected, right? When we're around people that are similar to us, we feel more protected. And I think that what we need to understand is that even though that's a natural instinct, which was very valuable when we were hunter-gatherers, in a civilized society with, you know, people from all over the world, it might be a detriment. Right, and, and, and we need to be a little bit more open-minded and humble about other people's experiences. But if you're not seeing that from the executives at the top, it's not gonna filter down through the organization. And it's even worse, because if you're not seeing it at the top and someone's trying to do it at middle management, that person's gonna get ostracized and be penalized for trying to implement that type of uh, environment. Thank you, Omar. I agree with everything that was said. Um, that was so spot on. I, if I can just also add in accountability is important. You know, we can have these trainings and, um, but it's really about holding everyone accountable. You know, I, um, I don't know if the gyms are, I think the gyms are opening back up now, but I used to go to Planet Fitness and they had this no jerks allowed rule, right? Um, and I thought that was so important, right? For me, as someone who does not, I'm not an avid, you know, workout person, like I'm just not, but I'm trying. I don't feel comfortable going to a gym and everybody's, you know, all buffed up and they're throwing weights here and there, right? And so 
Planet Fitness actually created this environment where it said, hey, anyone can come and work out here. And I think that um, having that no jerks allowed um, policy or infiltrating that into a culture is so important. Um, let employees know what is going on at the company from a DNI or IND um, perspective. You know, um, I know that Craig shared the uh, analogy of being invited um, to the party, not being invited to dance. Like, think about it this way. Um, let's say you do go out to a party and you go up to the DJ and you request a song and then the DJ plays your song. Right? Everybody goes crazy. Everyone's hyped. So I do think it's so important for uh, leaders to let employees know what it is that they are doing, even if it is um, at the top, so that they can feel like they are a part of the conversation, that they can get excited about it because they are going to be the biggest champions for the organization. Uh, another thing is not allowing privilege to um, opt out of conversations. You know, I know that there are many of us that don't feel comfortable talking about things related to uh, diversity or inclusion. Um, but there are a lot of us that just don't have the option to opt out of racism, sexism, ableism, right? This is a humanity issue at hand. And so um, encouraging those that although you may not feel comfortable, know that we all have a responsibility here. Right. And so I think it's important to make employees feel that they can um, be comfortable talking about these things. And if they're not, it's OK to say that, hey, I'm not really sure what to say here, or how to go about it. But I do want to make an effort. I'm doing X, Y and Z. Just lay it all out and let's really start to um, have this dialogue so that we can move forward. Um, so those are some things that I would say about um, you know, being more inclusive inside the organization. Great, thank you. So Leticia, this was a perfect lead in. I'd, I'd like to touch upon some of the questions that have been coming in uh, through the, the chat while, while we've been talking here today. Uh, so one of the first questions we received is how do you create, uh, how do you handle prejudices when they come up in the workplace? And I think this kind of relates a little bit to what Craig was talking about earlier uh, when uh, TIA got together and tried to have open dialogue. How do you create a space where folks feel comfortable, uh, that, they, that there's some level of trust that you can kind of speak openly to try to uh, address some of these sensitive topics. Hey, George, I'll, I'll um, hop in here. Yeah, it's, um, it's not easy. And it's funny, I saw when that question first came in and I was like, yeah, this is, this is we're, we're jumping right into the deep end on this. And so um, the, we, we have to create the environment and the um, and, and this, this, this safe place within an organization to have these crucial conversations, these real um, bold uh, moments. And so part of that is providing the leaders and the managers within an organization with the tools and resources to have it. You just can't say, all right, this is what we're going to do and good luck. Um, it was clear following, um, you know, the, the George Floyd um, uh, killing, there were a lot of people who wanted to engage on this, but didn't have the words, didn't have um, the, the, the confidence that they can take their team through a conversation around this and, and open up. And what Leticia said, it starts at the top. And Jorge, uh, I'm sorry, Omar talked about this as well. It's, it starts from the, the leadership, making sure that the environment within the company, within any organization says it is okay for you to have these conversations. It is okay for you to engage your employees on this and not expect them to check their, their concerns at the door. And then beyond that, make sure that you're going out and um, providing the tools and the resources to, um, to do that and try to educate them about it. I also saw another question about having a chief diversity officer and those things, is it good or, or, or not? It's been beneficial for us. There's a risk with having a, a CDO because then you can, if, if the company doesn't embrace it, you can say, well, it's that person's responsibility. It's not mine. But when you have somebody that all day, every day, that's a part of the senior leadership um, team um, is thinking about this and is given the support and the license to be able to to lead in this way that I think we have at TIA, 
then the investment and the practices to be able to support those um, those leaders there, and then it trickles down from that. And then you hold people accountable to what Leticia was saying. If they're not taking those steps, then there has to be accountability measures. Otherwise, it's going to fall through, Bob. I, I'd add. I think everything is exactly on on point with that. And there's what I think leaders need to do is come to this situation. And, and Omar used this phrase, the, the word, and I think it's the best word that that describes all the problems with with humanity is humility having humility is critical in all of this and having when it comes to these conversations a le level of vulnerability and it has to be a safe space where everyone and craig's exactly right we started with smaller groups um, because we wanted everyone to feel comfortable to be able to say things that they may be concerned if you say the wrong thing am i going to upset the group and I, as long as people are operating from a level of sincerity that we're all trying to understand and we all want to see what it, what its life is like through a different lens. You, you build that trust and we're building muscles that most firms and ours included don't have. I mean, we're doing things that are, that are getting point to the, and I'm grateful for all, all my colleagues who've been very patient with me as, as you make some missteps along there and, and allowing me to ask questions and to learn. And I think that's got to, to, to be the start of it. And then it has to filter down and it has to be intentional. It has to be a priority. If it stops being a priority in 2021, because something else comes up, then we're going to have this conversation again and nothing's going to get better. So that, that comes to the accountability. And we've tried it. We've, we've told folks show, not tell. We can sit here and we can write strongly, you know, well, well written letters and all those things about how much we don't like what's going on. But if we don't start acting and showing you by examples and getting better, then it all is a very hollow comments. Yeah. So going along with uh, with the accountability and that's really the way you you, you begin to stop it, right? Um, there's a phrase that I use with all of my managers, which is what you ignore, you accept, right? So if you're managing one of our stores and the floor is dirty and you don't do anything about it, you're accepting that a dirty floor is fine. That's okay. If the chicken is coming in in a bad condition and you're not doing anything about it, you're accepting that we're going to sell bad chicken, right? So it's not acceptable. So what you ignore, you accept. And that's the same with the interactions between the employees. In the Latin American community, in, in Spanish-speaking communities in general, we have a habit of giving nicknames based on physical attributes, right? So if you're short, your nickname becomes short. And if you're tall, your nickname becomes tall. And, you know, it, it's a cultural thing that we grew up with. And these nicknames uh, go generations and people answer to them. And they're fine with being called short or being called tall or being called skinny or being called fat. You know, that's just how they've been called since they were a little kid. I've tried to put an end to that. I said, that's not acceptable, right? That's, his name is not short. His name is Juan. His name is Pedro, right? That, that's not a black employee. That's an employee, right? That's not, uh, that's not an, a, an, a Vietnamese cashier. Her name is Mary, right? So by, by removing that, uh, again, it's almost unconscious, but making people conscious about it saying, think about what you're saying. This person is not just that physical attribute that they have. This person has a name, they're a person, they're to be respected, just like you, just like anybody else. And that begins to change the mindset within the store and within the way that the employees relate to each other. Because now it's not, there's, you know, skinny. Now it's, there's my friend, Pedro, you know? So, uh, so what you ignore, you accept. Don't ignore things that seem innocuous, right? You have to challenge them. You have to correct them at the moment. My experience is you correct it the first time, it never happens again, right? Just the shock of correcting it once will correct it forever. So it's, I, I think that that's, a, that that's a piece of accountability that's very important to, to put into place. Great, thank you, Omar. <clears throat> okay, so another question that came in here I'd like to read. Uh, we are starting up a diversity committee at my job. What are some helpful tips or suggestions that you can offer up to make this a, a success? Uh, 
I'll, I'll chime in on that. Um, congratulations on starting that uh, diversity committee. Um, that's gonna be extremely valuable. Um, would encourage, um, and I'm not sure if the person that asked this is in a leadership role and is driving it, but so important to make sure that you do have the uh, proper resources, but also um, leadership involved too, and understanding what is going to be most important to um, the leaders in the organization, making sure that it is tied to um, some metrics. Um, and I would say be, be bold, you know? Um, this is your opportunity to really drive um, change within the organization. And so figure out where the priorities need to be placed by working in tandem um, with leadership. Um, make sure that the goals of this committee is tied to the values and mission and vision of the organization. Um, and I, if I can also just say to give yourself some grace here as well, you know, um, it, it may not be, it may not be easy, but it's going to be worth it. I'm not sure if you're looking at specific groups or populations that you want to impact with this committee, um, but it would be important to also um, have conversations with those that you are looking to make change and, and understand what their experience in the organization is and what they would like to see from the company. So making sure that you have solid support from the top um, and solid buy-in from the top is huge. Um, that you're setting up proper communication channels to keep them uh, to keep them looped in, and then setting those goals um, from the from the jump, um, and, and sharing those goals so that it really can be um, not only received well, but when you think about rolling this out to the entire organization, that everyone is on board and, and excited um, about it. And again, that they. Uh, feel like they can benefit from um, the things that you are going to be offering in this committee. So best of luck. Great. Thank you, Leticia. All right. Um, let's see. Sorry, uh, just trying to see what would be a good one here. Okay, so Leticia, this is kind of also building off another point that you've made. I'd like to also hear from everyone here as well, though. How do employees start these conversations with, with leaders besides just kind of raising this issue, right? So it, you mentioned you're not sure if someone's in a leadership role, for instance, on this diversity committee. Imagine that you're an employee who is lower within an organization, but you want to initiate this conversation with those around you. What are some good ways that you can do this that are respectful either with your immediate supervisor or somebody who's higher up in a leadership leadership role? Yeah, these conversations cannot be had without without some type of trust, you know? And so I, I teach a lot of allyship trainings and a big question that I get is from attendees as well. I, I want to bring this up to a colleague of mine, but I don't think that they would be you know, willing to really have this conversation with me. You can't really force someone to have a conversation if that trust is not there, if they don't feel emotionally or psychologically safe uh, within the organization. But if you are someone that is um, maybe not in a leadership role, yes, please voice how you feel to your higher up if you do have that relationship find someone in the organization, a mentor, I did say sponsor earlier, um, that you can have a conversation with. And of course there's, you know, HR, um, if anything needs to be um, kind of going up the food chain here, um, but have a conversation. Don't keep it all in. Uh, I'm seeing that right now is a great time for um, that vulnerability as uh, one of our panelists mentioned and, and, and ears and hearts and minds are open. So take advantage of it um, before going into these conversations on both ends. It's so important to also communicate um, goals of the conversation as well. And if you do feel nervous or scared, you know, about it, it is okay to, to say that again, hey, I, I don't know if I have all the answers, but I just want to see if you would be willing to have a conversation with me. Um, and also know that if something is brought up 
you know, there may be additional conversations, you know, to be had as well. So just know once that conversation is out there, um, see if you can be a part of the solution. And George, if I can hop in, I mean, the, everything Leticia said was, was spot on. And just to give an example of how that can show up, um, again, back in June, um, social uh, the racial and, and social justice movement is kicking off following George Floyd. And um, an employee had reached out to me. She's not on my team. Um, someone uh, fairly, you know, entry level role, um, individual contributor and said, Hey, Craig, I was wondering, um, do you think we would be able to recognize Juneteenth that's coming up for the organization? We have it. And for those that are not aware of Juneteenth, it's the day that um, recognizes the final day of slavery in the country. And, um, and I said, you know, it's a phenomenal suggestion. Let me pull this forward. And then I took it and, and went to, to my manager who said, Phenomenal idea, took it across our leadership team and our entire division ended up recognizing this day from somebody who was bold. And it was not easy for her to say, hey, you know, let me reach out. But she felt safe enough based upon what we had been doing and talking about to say, you know what, I'm gonna raise this. It was important to her. And then it ended up becoming something that the entire company ended up recognizing um, eventually. And that might be something that we do from this point forward because somebody um, felt comfortable enough to do that. So yeah, be bold, go to a safe place, and then um, continue to, to be persistent in that following up. Craig, I think I, I would, I'm sorry, I'll jump in real, real quick one. Uh, to, to everyone out there, senior leadership is, is going to be, should be very receptive to this. They don't have the answers. I, I can speak personally. They, they need to hear from, from people all in, throughout the organization. So if, if you as an individual are uncomfortable having the conversation, they're probably going to be equally uncomfortable with it, but that's, you're going to go through it together and, and find someone in, in the organization that is willing to have it, willing to learn, willing to be open-minded, and you can grow in this area together. Um, even those at the top of the organization, as I said before, do not have this, these muscles. They're building them now as they go along, and only through dialogue and through some level of friction Will this? Will they start? Everyone start to, to build on these. So I would not be shy, and the phrase "be bold" has been used, but I would would wildly encourage it because people at all levels of the organization are looking to get engaged. Great, thank you, Mike. All right, we're just at a just about out of time, but I did want to just go around one more time with each of our panelists and just give you uh, just a quick moment to say any kind of final takeaways or words of advice that you have for our audience today. Anyone uh, care to go first? I'll, I'll jump in, George. Um, for those leaders out there that, that are listening in, be intentional about um, diversity and inclusion. Measure it. Um, don't be afraid to, um, to take some bold steps, um, but be intentional with the things that you do. For those people who are um, not in those uh, positions to, to make immediate change, make sure, I say again, be bold, but you have a voice and the, your voice matters and believe that and be willing to step up and, and, and share that voice. So that's what I would, I'll leave with George. Thank you. Um, I would say since this is a college forum and I'm guessing there's a lot of college students watching that uh, don't be frustrated if it doesn't work the first time, right? I think that that's, uh, that's, that's an experience that I've had with some employees that they they come with a suggestion it's a very good suggestion but it's not ready to be implemented at that moment right and that leads to some frustration and i have to explain you have to have some patience there's processes it takes a little bit of time it's not that i'm ignoring it or that we're ignoring it it's that it's just it's not going to be done from one day to the next i think everyone's intentions are in the right place we all want to get to the same goal. We all have different ways of getting there, right? Um, and I think I remember when I was when I was young, if if I wanted to do something and it didn't get done right away, then I just didn't want to do it anymore, right? And I realize now as I'm older that I probably could have gotten a lot more done if I had been a little bit more persistent and more patient and understood that the first no is not a permanent no, right? So if you go with a suggestion. And the answer that time is no, 
right? Instead of just discarding the whole thing, try and find out what you can do so that the next time it's going to be a maybe. And then the third time it's going to be a yes, right? Because sometimes change is gradual and, more, and slower than what we want it to be. And unfortunately, I think that's just something that everyone's, everyone has to deal with and everybody learns at a different stage. So don't be frustrated if the world doesn't change tomorrow. Keep trying to change it because it will change eventually. I'll, I'll, I'll echo everything that's been said. And I'll, and I'll say for, for individuals who, who come from a, a lens that I do as, as a white male, I'd say you got to listen more. We don't have answers in this area. We've got to be willing to listen a lot more and then act and then support our, our colleagues. Um, but I think that's one of the things that I've, has been a, a wake up call to me is to listen more and not, not put my ideas out there because I don't, I don't have all the answers. Um, there's a very good book out there that I'm, was recommended by a colleague of mine, White Fragility. Um, it's, it's a powerful story, but you need to go into it with an open mind and be willing to, 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 to do it. I think that's, hopefully we do this in society in general as we li listen more about what perspectives others are having, um, but that would be certainly something I would recommend to, to a population. Right, thanks. Leticia? Yes. Um, one thing that we did not mention is um, the pandemic. You know, we are in a very unusual time. And for any organizational leaders here, um, please just take into account how this could also be impacting your employees, especially marginalized employees who are much more significantly impacted um, on all fronts, health, finance, um, many employees are, um, especially those working mothers, are also trying to support their, their kids while they are in school virtually and, and also continuing to work. So, you know, I think the biggest thing that I've learned, not just from the lens of uh, DNI, but just from 2020 alone, is giving each other grace here um, and just being more patient. Um, that was already mentioned. I would also say that when it comes to working towards being more inclusive, understand that it may not be your fault or my fault, but it's our responsibility. And we can all make change and impact no matter what level um, you're at. And so please know that. Um, also, we can all recognize our own privileges as well. I have privileges um, and I think it is important to have conversations with those that don't look like you. Um, understand their perspective in life, understand um, how, what their experience is in the organization. And you don't know how just having a conversation with someone, how much that could actually even impact them for the better. Um, so um, that's what I would say. Thank you for having me. Great. Thank you all. I'll go ahead and turn things over now to uh, Dr. Troyer, who will close things out for us today. But thank you, George, and a big thank you to our panelists. Thank you for sharing your personal experiences as well as your knowledge um, with us today. So um, I just want to invite everybody to join us again on October 15th at noon for our next Dean's Leadership Series event. So that one will be on the implications of COVID-19 for commercial real estate. Um, you can learn more about this and other 50th anniversary events at bellcollege.uncc. At edu slash 50. So thank you for joining us today. Please stay safe and stay well.